Oh, hi, everybody. How you doing? Nice to see a good turnout. Okay. Go ahead and start my screen sharing. So go ahead and jump on that live stream. Okay, looks like people are joining in and going to the live stream, which is good. And even though I know most people prefer to type instead of unmute themselves and talk, um, just go ahead and sign into the voice channel as well. So, and the voice channel. And just the reasoning for that is the, um, for attendance purposes, I just take a screenshot of who's in the voice channel. And there are some people who don't have their actual name. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I have over time, like, either messaged them and figured it out, made a note. But most people, it's easier. Yeah, in this class, most people have their real name, so that's good. Then we have the cameraman. Okay, anyways, so let's see. Anybody have any questions? No, everybody's good. Somebody was unmuted, but maybe it was just they were muting themselves. Um, okay, so great. Let's go ahead and get started. So if we check the syllabus, we can see that we're going to go over... Um, Object-oriented design today. We're going to talk a little more about exceptions and Java input-output. And I've got this nice tutorial for you guys to follow. And then I've got test two open. So I guess we'll just go in order um, from the bottom to the top. Right? We could go in any direction, but we'll just do that. So the first thing to talk about is programming exam two. So there are no submissions because I just opened it like 10, 20 minutes ago. Um, and let's read through it. Okay. It says, write your code inside of second programming exam.java. So the, everything you do is going to have uh, be inside of second programming exam Java. So if you were to look at the starter code, by going to open and meme or IDE. And then we just go to summer 2020 Java, programming exam two. Um, oh, there is one thing I think I need to fix on this. I think there is one thing I have to fix. Let me see here. Let me download the starter code. Open this up. Yep, there is one thing I want to fix. Yep, yep, yep. Just takes one second and then it'll be fixed. Oh, 
Okay, great. So, <clears throat> what did I just fix? What I just fixed was I had left the package inside the inside the file, but now the package should be gone. So if we go back here to summer 2020 Java, programming exam two, second programming exam, that's probably just an issue you have to refresh the page. But if you were following along and you saw the package on top, you would just delete the package, right? So if you just opened the file before I deleted the package, all you have to do is just highlight the package line and delete it. So it's just it's just a single line. There's nothing to worry about. No no big issue there. Okay? So this is basically what the starter code should look like once you've erased your package. This is what it looks like. That's your starter code. Okay? So if I was to download that, I could just show it in the folder and put it right here. That's it. That's, that's all you're submitting. Just with your code in there. OK, so with all that said, let's go ahead and look at the coding issues that you're going to be working with. So. First, given two strings, A and B, create a bigger string made of the first char of A, the second char of B, the second char of A, the second char of B, and so on. Any leftover characters go at the end of the result. So we have mix A, B, C, and X, Y, Z. So the way it goes is A, B, C is first, X, Y, Z is second. So it's A, X, B, Y, C, Z. Okay, if one is shorter, it goes H, T, I, H, and then the rest of fair. Does anybody have any questions on part one on mixed string? Okay, very good. So let's go on to part two. Given an array of integers, create an array of integers in the same order with all the items less than five. If the element of the array is greater than five, ignore it from the new integer array. Couldn't be more straightforward. Anything less than five, you are going to, you are going to, um, you are going to keep. Okay, if it's so it's less than five. Let me let, I think I lost my train of thought. If it's less than five, then you keep it. If it's greater than five, you ignore it. Okay. Um, so that leaves the question of what do we do if it's five? Let's see. Let me add in if it's greater than or equal. Okay, hold on. I have one more thing to change. All right, let's see here. Given an array of integers, create an array of integers in the same order with all the items less than five. If the, or if the element of the array is greater than or equal to five, ignore it from the new integer array. Okay? So it's just really important that I read through these and I make sure that there's no ambiguities, right? So I write these and then I try to. I try to make sure that everybody can understand in plain English what's what's being asked of you with the question. Okay? So that's why I, if I see something like that, I try to jump on it and add it in. All right, any questions about part two? Okay, sounds pretty good. Pretty straightforward stuff here. And then we have part three. 
create a class tire with the following. This is the closest thing to the previous exercise. Brand, string, current PSI, double. Your constructor should look like this. Public tire, string brand, double current PSI. Then write a public method check pressure that prints out whether the current PSI is less than 45. If the current PSI is less than 45, print out too low. Otherwise, print out acceptable pressure. So again, this is really important that you get these exactly right. So things such as periods make a difference. Now, it's, it's really important that you get that eye towards detail. That's, that's a goal. Okay, and then lastly, we have create a class car with the following. Horsepower, integer, operable, boolean, cost, double, tires, and array of four tire objects. Your constructor should look like this. You're only making one constructor, and you don't even have to send in the array of tire objects. It just looks like this. Public car, int horsepower, boolean operable, double cost. And you're going to write one method for this class, class car. Write a public method is powerful that returns true if the car's horsepower is 300 or greater, or false if the horsepower is less than 300. All right. So, any questions on part three of this exam? So, just take note of when it's due. The due date is July 18th, 2020. And then you're going to have three late days. But for the tires, I don't get what it means by four objects. Okay, so what is an object in Java? Let's see. I think. I think I've tried to explain this, but maybe it's not been super clear when I say it. So can anybody in the class try to explain what is an object in Java? Okay, anything that's not primitive, that's, that's a good start, good start. Let's see, what else can people add? What is an object in, in Java? Anybody? try to give an explanation for it? Okay, all right, we got some really excellent answers here. So the first, an instance of a class. Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it, an instance of a class. So you have the class, which is the template, and then you have your object, which is going to be the, the instance, and you make objects from the class. Okay, so you can have many different objects with different properties from a class. So then the next answer is good when you use new. That's, that's also good. Well, thumbs up for that one too. And then, yes, Julio's right. It does have behaviors. And you when you have a class, you're not only putting properties, right? Classes have fields, properties, okay? Sometimes they're called attributes and behaviors, which are methods. So your, your car can turn on, your car can um, accelerate, your car can do lots of different things. So those would be behaviors, and then the attributes might be four tires. So you would have an array of tires. So it would be, if let's say that you were representing your tires with a, um, I don't know, a, an array of strings. Well, you, you would do it like this. You would say string array tires equals, and then let's say that you have, for some weird reason, Four different types of tires. You have a Goodyear tire. You have a um, Yokohama 
right? And then you have a blah, and then you have a blah. I mean, I don't know why you'd have four different tires. It's kind of weird, but you see, at least now you have a record. You can keep track of the different tires. So let's see. Some you were gonna uh, type something else out. All right. What do we do if the if the horsepower is, is exactly three hundred? Well, if the car's horsepower is three hundred, then you're going to say it's true. It is powerful. So then true, return true. It is powerful. No, that's good. That that's important. You know, when when I write these questions, if if there's any sort of ambiguity, then people won't be able to answer them. It would be it would be just impossible. So I try really hard to make sure everything is super clear and All right. Now we got a new question coming in. Let's see what the dictionary definition is. Uh, yeah, no, you don't know. Just just use one file. Use one file. That makes it simpler. So, I mean, I think Memer would accept three separate files, but one of them has to be second programming exam .java and and that yeah, just it's simpler if you just put everything in there. So, just for everybody's um, sanity, just include everything in there great well people sure are asking good questions um so let's look up the dictionary definition of java object definition let's see what the let's see what techopedia says okay, this looks pretty good So read that definition of from Techopedia. For part one, do we need to output the new string in main? So let's let's go look here. No, you you don't have to do anything in main. Like I, I have a main, I have a main that will test your methods. Okay, so I have a main that will make these different strings and then send in the different strings and then compare your output. Right, with what your method gets with what my method gets. I mean, you you can you can call the methods in a main in testing. So yeah, create a main for yourself to test. That's that's not a bad idea. I mean, if somebody was really confident, they could just make the methods and then ne make the class and never test them and turn it in, and they might get a perfect score just because um, they're you know they're able to see the behavior. But I think most of you would probably want to call these different methods, run the methods, run the classes, make sure that the behavior is what you expect. Um, no, Memer, you'll see the output.
So it's actually not much different from Homeworks. It's just, um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just different. Now, um, so here's the thing. If I go look at the, if I go look at the exam here, let, let's look at this. Let's go to the main pa page. Okay, for each of my classes, oh my God, somebody just finished it. That's so we can see from these different assignments, we have 76% finished for the object oriented assignment, 71% finished for student project. In my Python class, less than 70% found the min, max, and average. Now, let, let's let's be be honest. If you are getting, if you're taking a college level programming class, and you're asked to find the minimum, the maximum, and the average, that's not exactly like the hardest thing in the world. Now, there, I'm sure if you're just starting to program, there are going to be some issues. But just stepping back from the actual syntax, that that shouldn't sound like it's a super complicated thing because you go through a list of numbers, you find the smallest one. Uh, anyways, the point is there are even built-in functions to do that for you if you just Google in Python. So the students who aren't turning in the assignments, now that we're going on through the summer, they really should consider maybe taking a withdrawal. So if you aren't turning in the assignments, then that's what W's are for. You know, in, in my earlier class today, a student typed out, sorry, I can't participate much. I got called into work. Well, if, if you're not really focusing 100% on the class because you're working too hard, then you got to evaluate, am I going to get a good grade in this class? And if if not, because of other issues, then you just need to consider that's not a bad choice sometimes, right? To, to take a W, there's a reason colleges give it, because people signed up for too many courses, they're working too much. But I am pointing out that there are students not turning in some of these assignments. I'm not showing you names. I'm not saying, oh, this person didn't turn it in, this person didn't turn it in. Most people are turning it in. So... That's good. That's that's very positive. But for those people who aren't turning in assignments, just consider maybe taking the withdrawal because that would be better than getting a really low grade. Okay, so that's the exam. That's on Memer. And I think that's enough of that. So we can move on. And now we can look at the next thing. Complete the following lessons. So let's just go in order from bottom to top. Okay, so now let's click on exceptions. Okay, the Java programming language uses exceptions to handle errors and other exceptional events. This lesson describes when and how to use exceptions. So first, let's click on what is an exception. All right, so we see the term exception is shorthand for the phrase exceptional event. An exception is an event which occurs during the execution of a program that disrupts the normal flow of the program's instructions. When an error occurs within a method, the method creates an object and hands it off to the runtime system. The object, called an exception object, contains information about the error including its type and the state of the program when the error occurred. Creating an exception object and handing it to the runtime system is called throwing an exception. So I think when we started working with files and I would say, okay, we can throw an exception, maybe the, this sort of tutorial will help you to master the lingo. They have a lot of great uh, um, diagrams, and it goes goes on. It's not super long, but it's a good tutorial. So I'd, I'd recommend that you go through it. I'm, I'm not going to just read it to you because that's 
that's not good use of time, I don't think. But it, it's really straightforward to read. And, and I think that's definitely going to help you to understand more about exceptions. So make sure to find some time to read through that tutorial. It will help with vocabulary and some important concepts about exceptions. OK, great. And then we're moving on to Object Oriented Design 2. So let's now go on to this link. OK. Let's go ahead and click on that link. It should say Object Oriented Design. And today we're going to talk about the software lifecycle how you can discover new classes and methods, and it's it's going to be really, really important. So it's important to pay attention. We'll see what's inheritance, what's aggregation, what are dependency relationships between classes. We'll talk a little bit about UML class diagrams. I feel like we've mentioned UML before, correct? Has UML ever come up during class? Maybe not. It has. OK, good. All right. And then we'll learn how to use object-oriented design to build complex programs. So the software life cycle. This encompasses all activities from the initial analysis until obsolescence. So. During this, during this course, um, we've talked about a lot of different sites that exist for us to practice the basics of syntax, problem solving techniques, um, the efficiency of algorithms, things like that. Now, there's definitely something to be said. I reminded my C++ students about this today, about Picking a project, something that you're interested in, and doing it from start to finish, beyond just something on Code Wars or something on HackerRank. So what sort of projects can you start with? Well, let's say that you, you like making games. Well, you could start with a simple game. Start with something like tic-tac-toe. And then after you do tic-tac-toe, you can make blackjack. And then you can make poker. And as time goes on, your games get better and better and better. And then you start thinking about how to move sprites around, like we looked at that Mario game. And you can do lots and lots of projects. But today is all about doing projects. It's all about from the initial idea to getting your code into the computer. Sometimes it helps to do a bit of planning instead of just immediately start programming. So that, that's what today is going to be all about. But I have seen students at Miami-Dade over the past decade just do amazing projects where they use Unity and, and they make awesome stuff. Like uh, students will say, oh, check this out. They'll send me a message. And you wouldn't believe what they're capable of, of doing. Now, some of them devote every waking minute to their projects. <laughs> so it's not like you're just going to, in five minutes, do an amazing project. It's it's a huge, huge time commitment. But I guess what I'm trying to inspire you is to just think about um, starting something, like just beyond the programming problems that, that we do on these different sites. I mean, for me personally, my job is less software engineer than programming syntax, um, how to explain problem solving, so a lot of the software lifecycle that we're talking about today doesn't pertain so much to my job, but um, knowing the basics of the syntax of multiple languages, that is really important to my job as an instructor here at Miami-Dade. So I do spend a lot of time on Code Wars. I spend a lot of time on Code Wars. So probably some of you have spent more time than others. Oh, before we get into the software lifecycle, I'm so glad that, that I remembered this. Um, I would like everybody to do the following. I would like everybody to go to 
code wars. And let me just leave here and check to make sure that you have this. Go to account settings and make sure that you have your clan set to be Miami Dade. This is this is important. I'd like everybody to be part of Miami Dade's organization. So some of you do. I have I have seen some of your I have seen some of your usernames here, but some people I, I still don't see. So if you could go ahead and do this right now, and then we go down here to where is it? Where is it? Home. Yeah. Okay. Also, go ahead and we'll also do this just to double check. Copy and paste your username here right now. Just so I can make sure I'm friends with you, I'd like to be friends on Code Wars. Okay? So just copy and paste your username. So it, it would be like this. So go to View Profile, and then you go like this. So let's all do that. Before we get into the software development life cycle, I just really want to make sure that everybody... All right. Okay, so follow... Okay, looks good. Looks good. Okay, yeah, a lot of people already do have the they already do have MDC on there. Okay, perfect. But your your name has a space in it? How does it have a space in it? Okay. Okay. All right. It looks like most people have added MDC, which is good. A few people haven't. So, yeah, but some people are putting spaces. I, I don't think... I'll try the spaces, but... I don't think I don't think the space will work. Yeah, see, Lewis, do you see what happens when I type in your name with a space? That's not that's not how to get there. Okay, all right. Looking good.
How do I change the profile picture? Um, oh, okay. I do know an answer to that. I, you have to, you have to do your, you have to change your, um, ah, add your GitHub profile. I don't know any other way to do that. So, um, if you don't, if you don't have a GitHub, you can make a GitHub and you probably should if you, um, if you're in this field. So I, I would definitely say to make a GitHub and I mean, you don't have to use your real picture on it. I used mine, but, um, but I don't think you can change it unless you, unless you do that. Okay. All right. Okay, looks good. So do 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 looks good. Got everybody done. So yeah, the little time consuming, but it was important to do because I just wanted all the Miami-Dade students to be doing this. Now, last summer, this student, Cesar Ruiz, he did a lot of these puzzles. <laughs> he, was, he was really into it. Like, he would do them all the time. And he actually had a pretty, um, uh, well, not pretty. He had a really good job. He was the director of business intelligence at the Nicholas... Children's Hospital. So hospital executives get paid a lot of money and they have a lot of data and a lot of laws that they have to follow. And it's, I mean, I think, I, I, well, no, I think he did have a degree. Yeah, he had a degree from years ago. He was in his 40s, but he, um, he was getting another degree here at Miami-Dade. He's studying the data analytics program. Have any of you guys ever heard of that program? Have you guys, have you heard of this? Okay, one person has. It, it's a really good program. I mean, a lot of the people in it already have good jobs. They're just... I guess they want better job. <laughs> it's hard to think of a like higher up in the field if you're still in South Florida. Yeah, I mean, I would recommend it because they have some really cool people as part of it. MDC Data Analytics. I'll just show you the link. It's a bachelor's degree, so you wouldn't need to transfer anywhere else. So I, I get a lot of the data analytics students who take Python with me. I teach them Python. And that's, that's how I meet these students. But anyways, he was um, already employed. You know, he's, he would just do these problems for fun just because he was interested in them. And then another student, this guy, he would do a lot of these. He got accepted into an um, a, uh, accelerator in Silicon Valley. And he, he was an interesting fellow. And this guy made a chess game. I remember all the people who really are good at this stuff. I took him to a programming competition last year. So th there's definite advantages to doing a lot of these problems. I'm not saying you have to. Oh, my goodness. Someone in this class already has 85. That's amazing. So I wasn't even aware of that. So, yeah, some people, like, really can move move up here and do a lot of these problems. And, and it's good. It's good. It helps you with syntax. So it's useful. Okay. So very good. And the harder the problem that you do, the more points you get. So if you do all the easiest problems, you get fewer points, but if you do harder problems, then you get more points. So I think it's a fun, fun site. Okay. Let's close Code Wars and let's go back to this. All right. So now we're not talking about Code Wars or Hacker Rank. We're talking about actually building software that fills a need that people will use, we hope. So we need to describe the phases of the development process. We need to give guidelines for how to carry out the phases. 
and we have to think how are we going to develop this all right so we need to analyze the problem we need to write a design we need to implement then we need testing and deployment so a lot of times there are people who specialize in these different areas have any of you taken a course called systems analysis and design here at Miami Dade okay very good so Javier took it last semester and that would be focusing on the first parts the analysis and the design it's you know built into the name there and now what we're doing with this class is we're focusing on the syntax and implementation so our our code needs to be correct or else the compiler just won't run and and we won't get working code now testing this is where code wars i think does help because for all the problems lots of tests have been written now occasionally you'll come to a problem where you have to write the tests and i think those are valuable problems too because you have to think about, oh, how could I write these tests in order to make sure that the problem is really solved? So testing is an important part of writing software because things can go wrong and you have to well, deal with those possibilities. And lastly, deployment. This is how the end user is going to get the software. So deployment can be on an intranet, let's say, you're at a hospital and you only want people within the hospital to use something, you might install it on a server that's not exposed to the outside internet. So only in your building will the software run. Then you might have deployment where you put it on the internet and you're going to be letting anybody access your website. Or you might deploy on the Play Store if you're writing an Android app. Or what if you're writing an iOS app? What would you, how would you deploy an iOS app? Anyone want to take a shot? Yeah, App Store. That's it. No, that's right. And there you go. Now we've deployed our software. So this is going to be our topic tonight. So the first thing we have to think about, what is the project supposed to do? Okay. Don't think about how the program will accomplish the tasks. Just think about what it's going to do. And this is where you can write your requirements document, where You'll describe what the program will do once completed. You can write a user manual. You can have performance criteria. And now we move on to the implementation. All right. So we have to think about what are the structures that underlie the problem to be solved? What are the classes and methods you might need? So we could write a description of the classes and methods. We can have diagrams showing the relationships among the classes. Okay, this is what we do in here, in this class, for the most part. We write and compile code. The code implements the classes and methods discovered in the design phase. Now, for most of these examples, like let's think back to the exam you're going to do this week. I gave you the classes to write. I say, okay, make a class car, make a class um, tire, class whatever. And then you just have to follow the instructions. Now, I had a student who once moved to Miami from Costa Rica. And Costa Rica is not a very big country, so it was kind of memorable. And I said, oh, wow, Costa Rica, what were the programming classes like in Costa Rica? And he said, well, we didn't focus on syntax. We just focused on design and writing documentation. So we would turn in 20 pages about a business problem. And I said, well, that's like analysis and design, but didn't you have any coding? And he said, no, my particular instructors didn't have any coding. So that's just uh, something memorable I remember. Maybe 
his instructors were, I don't know, overly concerned with the documentation part. But the way that this class is, is written is we don't focus on that very much. We just focus on problems where we solve them and we think about the syntax. So there we go. Oh, you live there. That's cool. All right, let's move on. And testing. We run tests to verify the program works correctly. So we can have a report of the tests and their results. So we see this is what we were expecting. This is what actually happened. Married a girl there 12 years ago. It's a place I've actually always wanted to visit because the natural beauty of Costa Rica. Deployment. This is where the users install the program, and hopefully they use the program for its intended purpose. All right, so here's one way that you can design your program. You can start with analysis, and then move to design, and then move to implementation, and then move to testing, and then move to deployment. But what people found was when it was too rigidly applied, it didn't work, because there's going to be the need to go back to earlier stages where it's, it's not as simple as just saying, okay, we have completed the analysis, there's nothing else to know, we have completed the design, there's nothing else to know. That's just not the way people operate. So too strict, it doesn't work. The spiral model will break the development down into multiple phases. So the early phase is about prototypes. And then what you learn from making one prototype can be applied to the next prototype. The problem with this is you could have too many iterations and it can take too long to complete. All right, so here we see the spiral model just visually displayed. So thinking about the development process methodology, okay. So the people who developed UML, they listed out when is the activity taking place for all of these different parts of the process. So when you're business modeling, thinking about what is the problem at hand, well, that is toward the beginning. Okay, your requirements, a little bit after business modeling, analysis and design, implementation, testing, you should be doing some testing all the way through. And then deployment is toward the end, all right? So this is to give you an idea of when activities are taking place and, and how much um, they are at the beginning, inception, elaboration, construction, and transition. Okay, extreme programming. This is mostly about teams. So they strive for simplicity and they get rid of formal structure. They say, all right, let's do realistic plans. How long is it going to take to make this game? We think, we believe it's going to take us two months to make this game. All right, so they try to be as realistic as possible. They try to do small releases so people can see progress. All right, so the game isn't just something you're talking about. It's something you're building. Another thing to mention is pair programming. Pair programming can be beneficial. Now, I actually really have enjoyed using Slack. I, I mean, Discord. <laughs> I, I, I use Slack for other projects, but I actually have really enjoyed using Discord. I think probably there's just as, as much progress with students as when I'm in, in person. Um, does that mean I never want to go back in person? No, I'm. I'm willing to go back in person next semester. I know the numbers are horrible now, but hopefully in a month, people will be, um, you know, like a little smarter about some things because maybe spreading too much. Um, I mean, if, if we could snap our fingers and make this disease go away, of course, we, we would do that. Um, but, you know, the, the point is there's there's a lot of benefits to using 
Discord. I think there's there's a lot of good things about teaching programming remotely, but getting into in-person programming, in-person has a lot of bandwidth. Okay, so when you're in your next programming class in person, let's let's not be negative and say we're gonna be remote forever. Of course, we'll be back. We'll be back eventually, right? Probably next semester. Okay, when you're in person, there's a lot of bandwidth. You can talk to somebody and say, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? Talking in person, you see people's facial expressions. You, you, can, you can get a lot done in person. So I like that we've used Discord. I like that students message me a lot. Um, but as the course goes on, this is another thing about being able to message me so easily. As the course goes on and you get more and more confident with Java, you need to build up some of your searching techniques because getting to be a good searcher on Bing or Google or whatever, duck, duck, go, it doesn't matter, that's a skill. And the more you try to refine your searches, the better you get. So I'll, I'll try to ask people questions. If they write me a question, I'll say, well, have you tried this? Have you tried this? I, I try not to just immediately send you the answer, right? So, so you can improve your searching. That's my point. You can improve your searching abilities. Searching is not just you're either born with it or you're not. That, that's not true at all. So you, you can keep, keep trying to solve a problem by searching for new things. Okay. Um, let's move on from extreme programming. Okay, and we can skip past this. We're just moving ahead. Okay, so I went ahead to slide 21. I went to slide 21, just, just so we can do some other examples. So with object-oriented design, one of the first things that you need to do is you need to discover the classes. What are the classes in the problem? So I think before I've mentioned there's a good rule of thumb. Does anyone remember what the rule of thumb is? How can we do this? How can we think of the classes in a problem? And if I haven't mentioned it, just try to brainstorm. Try to think, what's, what's a way that we can discover the classes in a problem? Yes, exactly. Perfect. See what nouns are being used in the description. That's excellent. So you think about your nouns and you say, all right, this could be a class. This could be a class. It's not a science. It's a bit of an art, right? You have to think, hmm, this could be reasonable. This could be reasonable. And then another programmer might say, mm, I don't know. I don't think that that's such a good idea. Okay, so, so it's a process. A class represents a useful concept. So it could be a bank account, an ellipse, um, ellipses, products. It could be an abstract concept like a stream, a window. You find classes by looking for nouns. And then you define the behavior for each class. You find methods by looking for verbs. So here we have an invoice, right? This is how businesses will write out everything that happened. You've got the item, the quantity, the price, and the total. What are classes that could come to mind? Well, you could have class invoice, class line item, class customer. You keep a list of candidate classes, and then you brainstorm. You put all the ideas for classes onto the list. And then you cross out the ones that aren't useful later. Okay? So, the class represents a set of objects with the same behavior. Entities with multiple occurrences in the problem and description 
The problem description are good candidates for objects. So you see what do they have in common, and you design classes to capture commonalities. All right. Now, this is a good question. For the address, does it make sense to have a class address or use a string? Well, there might be a good reason to use a class address, or you might just want to use a string and just parse it with a regular expression or splitting or something. So not all classes can be discovered in the analysis phase, and some classes may already exist. So a CRC card could be something you actually write out, or it could be something virtually on your computer. And this is a class, its responsibilities, and its collaborators. Okay, so they're saying use an index card, but of course you can just do it online. You don't actually have to write it out. Okay, so that's what it could look like if it was on an index card. And then let's say you want to save to a file. A collaborator is a part of the Java program that you're going to work with. File writer is a good likely collaborator if you're writing to a file. Okay, so what's the purpose of the customer class? Well, that's where we get the shipping address of the customer. What do you do if a CRC card has 10 responsibilities? Well, if your class has too many responsibilities, probably need to come up with more classes. The idea isn't to just make a super class. You want to have just one class per concept, not a super, not a monster class. That does everything. All right, relationships between classes. Inheritance, aggregation, dependency. Inheritance is a relationship. Okay, is a. It's an is a relationship. So you have every savings account is a bank account. Every circle is a ellipse. Okay. Sometimes it's abused. Should the class tire be a subclass of class circle? Well, that doesn't really make sense. I mean, it, a tire is kind of a circle, but a has a relationship would be more appropriate there. Okay, so has a refers to aggregation, where objects of one class contain references to objects of another class. So this is actually where I get the idea for the tire. Um, part of your test just from these slides. And these slides are from a book called Big Java. That's really an excellent book. You can get it pretty cheap on Amazon, cheap on Amazon. And it's, it's easy to understand. So I, I put it on the syllabus just as a nice ancillary book. Right? But you don't, you don't have to get it. The, the author is a pretty, pretty interesting guy, Kay Horseman. Okay. So class car extends vehicle. So look at this diagram over here. We have a car has tires. The diamond shows aggregation. This is the UML notation. And then we see the inheritance here. The vehicle is the parent class and the car is the subclass or child class. Now in the systems analysis and design course, it was Javier, right? Did they cover UML in your class? Okay, maybe they didn't. So I, I imagine like people who design a systems analysis and design course, they have a lot of things to choose from. So it's possible that it was a really interesting class with a lot of good things to learn. Um, I mean, me personally, when I was in college, I, I found the course to be um, not my favorite. I didn't really like drawing out the diagrams too much. I mean, they were okay, but it, it just didn't have the same excitement of getting a problem right when you're writing a program. Um, so, yeah, it, I, I, I've never taught it at Miami Dade and probably wouldn't really have too much fun teaching it. Did you like the class? Just curious. Did you like it?
Oh, that's good. It was interesting. It's good. Maybe maybe I had a um, just a very dry activities when I took it. Who knows? Oh, yeah. Wow. I don't even think that existed when I took the course. Yeah. Agile methods. Hmm. Building prototypes in, in such an exaggerated quantity. Hmm. That is cool. Uh, and one last question, because I am curious about this. Did you take it online or in person? Online. Okay. Because I, I, I was thinking that they don't even have anybody at Kendall who, who offers it. I think it's only offered at North. All right, cool. So dependencies. Dependency uses relationship. So many of our applications depend on the scanner class to read input. All right. Aggregation is a stronger form of dependency. Use aggregation to remember another object between method calls. Okay, so these are the different symbols. If you were doing a UML diagram, so we have inheritance with the solid line and the triangle on the end. And then we have an interface implementation with dashes with dotted line and a triangle tip. Aggregation is a solid line with a diamond tip and dependency is a dotted line with an open arrow tip okay and let's skip ahead a little bit uh, well this just shows you another way of writing a uml diagram we can have our class name on top and then our attributes and then our methods okay so we have class name and then attributes and then methods. Oh, you did. Okay, that's cool. Now, now you saw that, and it, it came back. All right, cool. Yeah, the arrows. So we can kind of skip through a little bit. So we see a bank serves a customer. This is an association relationship. The idea is a designer, an analyst, well, we'll call them an analyst. That's a better term. The analyst draws this UML diagram, hands it over to the programmer, and then the programmer is able to write the code to solve the business problem. Okay? So the five-part development process. First, we have to gather requirements. Then we write out our CRC cards to get the classes, responsibilities, and collaborators. Then we make a UML diagram to record class relationships. Then we use Javadoc to document method behavior. And then we implement our program. Now, many of you are going on to FIU. I, I almost guarantee that's the plan, just because in the decade I've been teaching at Miami-Dade, the majority of students say they're moving on to FIU. Now, what I heard about Java 2 at FIU is a lot of documentation. A lot of documentation is required. So they're saying, look, you have to use Java doc to document method behavior. Now, I feel pretty confident that students who do well in this course where they actually can solve the problems on Memer, they do the problems on Code Wars, they have no trouble when they go on to FIU. Now, um, that doesn't mean everybody <laughs> does great at FIU. One of my top, top students, I mean, just one of the best of all time, really amazing, amazing student. He took a course and um, got a C plus 
in the in his final grade. Okay, he got a C plus in his final grade in his FIU class, and I couldn't believe such a strong student. I mean, he passed, right? He didn't fail. He moved on to the next course. Such a strong student would get such a low grade. And I said, well, how did everybody else do? And he said, oh, everybody else failed, right? Like all his friends failed. Everybody did terribly. You will encounter some courses in the future that have very, very rough, tough, um, <laughs> demanding, like, you know, progress. So then we see somebody saying the math killed you. Was it discrete math? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a hard class. That's a hard class. So, so the truth is that the, you got to put in the time, you got to put in the effort and, um, yeah. So that's, that's my, that's my message. All right. So I think we are going to stop looking at slides because you can't look at too many slides or else it gets boring. And now let's actually take a look here. Okay. So everybody click. <laughs> Someone's got a, a crying face, taking physics with calculus now. Yep. Got to be very, very precise. All right. So everybody go ahead and click on this link here that says OO Practice Summer 2020. And we have Class X and Class W. Okay, we have class X and class W. So how does this relate to the previous slides? What, what's the connection? Well, we don't really know what an X is or what a W is, but we can just imagine that they are something important that we discovered from analyzing a business process, right? And we can say that X and W are going to be needed to simulate this problem, to simulate this business process. Now let's look at the two classes. Is there any inheritance between the two? No, no inheritance. What would be the keyword to show an inheritance relationship between these two classes? Very good, extends. Excellent. So what about an aggregation relationship? Does X and W have an aggregation relationship? And, and that is a has a relationship. No, well, it, it, you're right. It doesn't. So it doesn't. The way we would give an aggregation relationship is we would say inside class W, okay, X, X, and then at the end, X equals new X, and we could just have 3 and H. Okay, so now W has an X. So I'll just copy this. Then paste it up here. Okay, so now W does have an X. So this is aggregation. Um, I gave class W an X, yeah. So you would say W, oh, I think I misspelled aggregation there. Let me spell that right. 
aggregation. Okay. Um, yes, I just gave W and X. Just to, just to point out what, what these terms mean. Okay. All right. So now if we go down to the public static void main, we can see I make some X objects. I make some W objects. So this is how we make objects. We see the new keyword. So this is just making objects from the classes. All right, then I can make an array of X's or an array list of W's. This is a little bit of an older style of making an array list. If you have the name in both diamonds, you actually could take out the name from the, the brackets on the right, but it's legal to keep it in as well. Okay, so now we get to your mission. It says, Allow the end user to enter W's into the array list until they type negative one. Allow the end user to enter W's into the array list until they type negative one. So once you start typing, once you start typing in the REPL, you will fork it and then you can work with it. Okay? So I'd like everybody to see if they can do this because um, I think that there's a problem with people being able to write these loops. So I'd like everybody to be able to let the user enter Ws into the array list until they type negative one. So any prompts are up to you making the scanner is up to you right so hopefully you remember how to make a scanner if you don't practice searching for it right how how do you make a scanner object okay any questions about this mission so in 10 minutes in 10 minutes let's share our solution so at 6:42 show your or link to your couple okay let's let's go ahead and do that
Okay, let's see. Was that enough time? Were you guys able to make your scanner, ask the user for the W info, and then add the info to the array list of Ws? Anyone get finished? Okay, so we have a student with a solution here. Oh, we have another solution. Okay, let's see here. We press enter. So let's see, we go down here, we see. Oh, I, th I thought it was just the exact same thing as mine, and I was saying, but no, it's just taking a minute to load. Okay, so let's see here. We have OO practice. Okay, nice. So we have here, while true, enter a double. Okay, good. That's a good prompt. D equals scan next double. Good, that's the correct use of what we need, and then if D is equal to negative one, we break. All right, that's, that's all good. And now this is the key thing, we're using the name of the array list dot add new WD. Yes, perfect, this looks really good. So this, this is a good solution. So I know a lot of you were probably still working on it just because people work at different speeds. And you can look at this answer or not, but now you have a correct answer to go back and practice with. So this can help you if you are still stuck later, right? So it's probably a good idea to you know, practice this again, or at least read over the code now to see how to do it, all right? So that's a good solution. Then we have another student who posted a link here. Okay, let's see. All right, so we go to OO practice. And, oh, okay, so we do have a little bit different solution here. This is good. Okay, so what is different? about these two approaches. Right. Yeah, exactly. He used a do while versus a while. So either approach is fine. There's 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 no issue there. And then well we have one more solution, so we'll just put it up here. So let's go to oopractice.java. Okay, we see, okay, a do while, looks good. All right, nice. Okay, great, excellent. So let's go back to our slideshow here and see that there's a lot of slides in this. There's Many, many slides. <laughs> so a lot of it's repetition. Um, we discover classes, nouns are possible classes. Okay. Um, we can analyze the classes. We can eliminate classes that we decide we don't need. Uh, 
All right, let's see. Um, I think I think I want to stop with the slideshow here, just because I think we've covered the main points about UML, etc. You see, the slideshow is really, really long. We would be here till ten o'clock at night if we did all these slides. So we'll just stop the slideshow right there. Okay. So cover the slideshow. I pointed out the link about catching and throwing exceptions. We talked about the test. So let's see, why don't we do a fun problem before we leave? And let's pick a fun one. So we have been to this site, correct? Yes. Okay. Just making sure. Good. So, so we're sort of getting back to the usual solve a problem quickly, not writing out design documentation, things like that. So we did the first problem, multiples of three and five, probably did that one together. And now on to this one, Fibonacci numbers. Have we done the Fibonacci numbers? Because I am teaching for programming class. Okay, perfect. This, this is a fun one. This is a good one. This is a good problem to solve. So each term in the Fibonacci sequence is generated by adding the previous two terms. By starting with 1 and 2, the first 10 terms will be 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. Look at the pattern. 1, 2 added together give you 3. 2, 3 added together give you 5. Okay? There you go. So, here's what I would like for you to do. I would like for you to go to your teams. So A, B, C, D. Was anybody not here the previous times we worked with the teams? Was anyone else absent those days? I guess not. So we have 40 minutes. 40 minutes is definitely enough time. 40 minutes is enough time to solve this problem. It's, it's not super difficult. In my C++ class, the students got it solved in, I would say, 20, 30 minutes. Okay, oh, Juan was absent, okay. So Juan, join Team A. And then I'll just go in order. As people say they were absent, I'll just put them in A, B, C, D. Okay, Andy and Team B. Okay. Yeah, if, if you were here for any of the times, right? Any of the times, that's fine. Okay, Julio wasn't here last time. So, Julio, Team C. All right. So, the idea is you will try things on your own and then share your progress with REPL, REPLIT. Now, I know some of you are incredibly fast, right? Like the proof is just, I showed the exam and then like after I was done talking for seven minutes, somebody had finished the exam. So if you can do this Fibonacci problem in two seconds, don't, don't just immediately give your answer to everybody. Try to sort of talk them through things and, and help that way, all right? So type ideas to each other. And then when you have a good solution, paste one REPL here, one REPLIT link here in the main chat, okay? And then you guys will, uh, I will take attendance a little bit closer to the end of, of class, just with the voice channel. And there we go. So does anybody have any questions? You're just finding all the even value terms of the Fibonacci sequence 
that are less than 4 million. So when you add them all together, what's the sum? Okay, that's it. Have fun. Yes. Oh, and you can mute the other channels and their notifications. Because you can already hear I have all the messages going. I, I might mute them too. <laughs> There's so many. Use case modeling. I will... I think I've heard of that. No, I haven't. Use case monitor. I'll look that up. <laughs>